And there are just a couple of things that I would say by, by way of introduction of why these particular um, speakers were privileged to have here today. So to my left is uh, Julie Kaplow with Texas Children's um, Hospital and um, the um, trauma, um, tra I'm sorry, the Trauma and, and Grief Center. And so one of the things that they thought through and, and something that I think that we can spend a little bit of time talking about is really kind of a systems related approach that they took in terms of addressing this issue with trauma and particularly with, with children. And um, Renee Vanya Tomsek, um, who is the CEO of um, Mental Health America, one of the things that, that she represents in terms of this work is what it means to be part of a multi-sector collaborative and addressing a disaster of this, this magnitude, and particularly as it relates to coordination of services with, um, among mental health providers. And then certainly uh, Mel Taylor with the Council uh, on Recovery represents really a, a, the continuity care across the spectrum of mental health services. And so one of the things that we sometimes overlook is the consideration around um, substance use disorders and just what happens to that when people are in extreme crisis. So um, I would ask each one of you, and, and starting with you, Julie, just to take a couple of minutes to talk about your response um, to the Harvey sure. situation. Thank you. This is that. Can, I, can everyone hear me? Yeah. OK. Um, well, first of all, I do want to just start by thanking Greater Houston Community Foundation. Everything I'm about to talk about um, really would not be possible without you. Um, so thank you. Um, I, so just to back up a little bit, the Trauma and Grief Center is housed within Texas Children's Hospital, and we serve kids ages seven to 21 who've experienced traumas or losses. And those traumas can range from sexual abuse, physical abuse, witnessing domestic violence, hurricane exposure, um, as well as different types of losses, including um, having a parent be deployed or deported, and also death. So we see a lot of children who are bereaved. Um, and really what our goal is within the Trauma and Grief Center is to provide evidence-based assessment and treatment to those kids. And we also provide a lot of training in the community. And our goal is we, we recognize that trauma and grief are very pervasive throughout our greater Houston community and we really want to be able to equip our community to provide the same types of services that we provide. Um, and in addition, we also do a lot of research looking at the effectiveness of what we're doing. So are the treatments that we're using working and which treatments work best for which children? And so when Harvey hit, we were again very fortunate to receive funding to launch our Harvey Resiliency and Recovery Program and the main goals of this program were really to first provide necessary risk screening and assessment among the many, many children who were affected by the hurricane. And the risk screening tool that we developed was really designed to assess what are those very potent risk factors that we know can impact kids over the longer term in terms of exposure to hurricane related issues. So for example, were they helicopter lifted? Were they trapped in their home? So those were the types of questions that we were asking within our survey. And then in addition, we recognized that many kids would not be able to access us. So another major initiative was, how do we get to those kids that are hard to reach? And then finally, we also recognized that many of our schools were really in trouble. Um, they didn't have the necessary training to be able to address the trauma-related needs of the kids. And so we launched many um, large-scale learning collaboratives where we brought together a number of different schools, school districts to train them in one of our treatments called Trauma and Grief Component Therapy that's really designed to be used in group settings and especially in schools. And it's also designed to be a tiered model that can address the needs of kids who may have just had some stress around Harvey as well as those kids who were severely traumatized. And so um, one of the access issues that we were very heavily involved in was helping families to get to us. So with the funding that we received, we were able to partner with Lyft, where we were able to bring families to us who did not have transportation. We also paid for parking. So for many families, that was a major obstacle. 
And then in addition, we have a Texas Children's Mobile Unit that goes out to many of the different schools in the area that primarily serve undocumented, underserved immigrant families. So we place two of our trauma and grief clinicians on that mobile unit to be able to provide evidence-based assessment and treatment of those kids. In addition, we trained hundreds of school-based clinicians in the treatment that I just mentioned, and they were then deployed out to the various schools that were hardest hit after Harvey to be able to provide those services in-house. And then the final um, issue that we're really trying to deal with now is really serving as a blueprint for how do we do this next time? And I, I hate to say next time, but we know there probably will be a next time. So how do we do this efficiently? How do we identify those kids that need us the most as quickly as possible? And how do we provide the most effective treatment in a way that um, in, ensures that we're capturing those kids that need us the most? Thank you. So, so actually our next time happened last night. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you don't mind passing the mic to Good morning, everybody. Um, one of the uh, main reasons that I traveled uh, here from Indiana to take this position last year was because of the type of work, of work that we do at Mental Health America. Our work is in systems change through a collective impact approach. So um, our, our strength in terms of, as it related to Harvey, was the fact that we already had the relationships that we needed to be able to provide a rapid response to, um, to the Hurricane Harvey crisis. So um, primarily our work was in three areas, uh, coordination of uh, school-based uh, resources. Um, we had opportunities, I know we were able to work with, with Julie and continue that partnership with her. Um, also in terms of working with primary care clinics. Uh, we were able to provide not only technical resources, but also financial resources to address uh, many of the issues. And, and um, in terms of the partnerships that we looked for, we really looked at not only the most vulnerable areas, but also what were the highest impact areas. Um, finally, um, the work continues actually in all our areas, but working at the community level, be able, uh, being able to provide training and workshops to really enhance resiliency in the community because as Julie mentioned, and of course with Imelda, it is going to happen again. Hi everybody. Um, so our, our, the Council on Recovery has been around since 1946 and we have had in place in various sizes, depending on resources and funding and opportunity, we've had in place for a 13 county region, a safety net of providers, uh, a centralized call center, uh, and an opportunity to provide a variety of services uh, for people initially largely with addiction and substance abuse disorder. And about 15 years ago, uh, took a hard look at who we were helping and the responses that we were getting and realized that we were missing the target. If we're looking at outcomes in addiction, you have to look at the co-occurring disorders that are taking place, specifically mental health disorders that are underlying or existing with. In short, and I'm a recovering alcoholic, show me somebody uh, who's an alcoholic, uh, active alcoholic, I'll show you somebody that's depressed. Uh, show me somebody that gets in recovery from addiction and I'll show you the depression scale go way down in their ability to function. So our work has been ongoing in responding to people and trauma and major crisis is typically what we see, not necessarily due to an external factor like a flood or a hurricane, but many times by the time we see people, their lives are in a complete disarray uh, no function and powerless to help themselves. That's why we see them. Our work really started in the assessment with Harvey. Started really with Katrina. When initially as things were happening, we were down at uh, George R. Brown and NRG and realizing that we were seeing a lot of people, particularly coming in from New Orleans, people who were on uh, methadone assistance programs, struggling with mental illness and left their pills and medications behind. 
So we were instantly gearing up to support whatever safety nets were in place. With Harvey, we were there before the storm, gearing up and talking to county officials, and literally before places were open for business, we were down there doing the same thing, setting up 12-step meetings and so on. So what we didn't realize and what we began to understand was that that was just the beginning. And we were seeing many of those people and saying to them, please come back. Here's our office address. Here's how you can get in touch with us. And there was no funding, but it was a natural extension for us. And we began talking at the staff level about what to do. We planned to target and we uh, initially thought we might serve uh, and spend this money over an 18 month period. To our really surprise, uh, we expended the funds and hit goals within nine months. We could have spent triple the, num the dollars that were made available for the trauma and behavioral health services that we were seeing. Uh, and one of the factors that I'll attribute that to was the fact that we went out into the community. We dispatched outreach coordinators who went to the most severe areas based on really the planning data that were coming out uh, from the work that the Greater Houston Community Foundation were putting out. We went out there and dispatched people basically to say, here's how to get help. The shocking part or the interesting part to us was that in a normal situation, we have a pretty high no-show rate. Uh, where people really want help and they're ready to come. In this situation, we had almost no 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 show rate. Uh, people were eager for help and really wanted to get help. So we'll talk more about that later. But that's the council's response uh, so far. That's great. I'm not sure this is working. I don't know why. Yeah. Can you all hear them? Oh, okay, great. Okay. So, so one of the things um, I want to ask you, Julie, to to talk about. So. In your work with schools and, and dealing with the children, one of the things that you found out is that these children had already experienced some level of trauma just based on the environment that they came from. So how do you, how do you deal with that and what is it that caregivers and parents and teachers should understand about working with children in that context? <clears throat> Thank you for raising that. So yes, so um, in fact we've had many different um, leaders from underserved communities and superintendents say to us that Harvey was a blessing in disguise because they have had so many children experience traumas over a long period of time and now they're finally able to get those types of services in the school. Um, and what we're actually finding is that the vast majority of kids who've experienced prior trauma have actually experienced bereavement. So the death of a loved one is the most common form of trauma that we're seeing among all of our greater Houston community. Um, and that's consistent actually with national data that bereavement is the most common. But the reason we think this is so important is because bereavement is also the most distressing form of trauma among both adults and children. So if you were to ask anybody, what's the hardest thing that's ever happened to you? The vast majority of people would say, it was the death of so-and-so. And in addition to that, we recently found in a study of 14,000 students that bereavement was the number one predictor of school problems above and beyond any other form of trauma, including sexual abuse, physical abuse, domestic violence. And so we're really wanting schools to pay close attention to this because as much as we want schools to become more trauma-informed, um, we also want them to be bereavement informed and know how do we address not just trauma in children, but grief and bereavement. And so that's um, something that we're paying close attention to now in all the trainings that we're doing, both with our school-based clinicians and with our teachers, we're really honing in on um, what, are, what are some important differences between post-traumatic stress and grief? How can teachers effectively deal with that? Um, we've had teachers say to us, I don't, I don't know, should I bring it up in the class that this child just lost his dad last week? You know, there are things that um, are just very different about grief that we also need to address. So those are some of the things that we're working on. And so it, to, to follow that train of thought, in, in working with teachers, do you also, and do they also have an opportunity 
to work with the parents in terms of reinforcing what they might be learning and doing within the schools. <clears throat> Absolutely. So we've also really tried to do um, more sort of community-based training to educate not just the teachers but the parents as well. So for example, after Harvey, there were a lot of questions and concerns about, you know, what is normative after a hurricane? What are some normative responses that, you know, may not be red flag issues? And then similarly, how do we identify those red flags over time? I will say that at this point in time, we are seeing more children who were affected by Harvey than we did even you know, six months after the hurricane. Um, and I think there may be several reasons for that, but I think that in the initial aftermath, parents and caregivers are much more logically concerned about safety and getting their homes rebuilt and focusing on basic needs and now over time they're seeing, oh wait a minute, my child's still not sleeping in his own bed, or my daughter freaked out last week with the storm. Um, and so now we're seeing a lot more mental health issues. And so really helping to educate both teachers and parents about how do you know if a child needs a more thorough assessment and potentially a higher level of support. Uh, and accessing schools because of the existing um, network that you have with them. So tell us um, help us understand how that work with schools allowed you to get in into the schools and particularly in those areas where you know were hard as hit within the district mm -hmm. so that's yeah. right right yeah. <laughs> okay all right so um you know several years ago um, we, we already had a, a significant network within the school system so um, what this opportunity, um, and it's odd to call it an opportunity, but you mentioned that earlier. Um, we were able to, um, again, connect all our partners, look at um, creating some unique partnerships and do unique work. So one of the things that um, we created was our Emotional Backpack Project, which um, when we talk about behavioral health, um, as opposed to somebody who has a cold, right? They go to a doctor, they get an anti antibiotic, and they're okay. Behavioral health is something that needs to be addressed over a longer period of time. So through our Emotional Backpack Project, that's a nine-month project where we are um, training people within the schools. One of the challenges that we had as an organization was we're a small organization and we're not service based so how are we going to get this information out to schools and, and train them with the resources that they need so um, for much of the work that we did we used a train the facilitator model and we're able to um, work within each of those schools um, one of the things that um, our um, my, my staff has, has told me, because I, I was not here during that time, um, is that the calls were coming in fast and furious for us. Um, much like you talked about, Mel, about the no-show rate, right? We, we could not respond quick enough. So through something like our Emotional Backpack Project, uh, right now I think we're working in 26 school districts, over nine months we're helping those teachers and those students build the capacity for um, addressing behavioral health needs for a number of reasons, right? Most of these children already had the trauma, some other trauma, and this just uh, exacerbated the various symptoms in that. So, so Mel, talk to us. Yeah, I think what's intriguing about um, the council's work is that you do mental health, you do behavioral health, you also focus on wellness. And so how were you working or able to deploy those services and, and still be able to um, work within the donor community to enhance or, or elevate the discussion around substance use um, in particular? Big question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I, you have to know this about the council, and that is that when a lot of people traditionally say behavioral health, they have a pretty clear understanding of mental health. They're not typically very clear on where substance abuse fits in. What we saw with the Harvey experience was a, is a pretty vivid demonstration of how substance abuse fits in. 
uh, and how it impacts people, particularly those that are uh, under the kind of stress, under the kind of crisis that uh, Harvey uh, demonstrated or brought to us. So we were aware, uh, and I have to say first, that staff didn't jump for joy when we proposed this idea. I called staff in and we talked about it because they were already overloaded. They're already under-resourced with tra traditional services that we provide. You know, we're getting 200,000 phone calls a year in a system for people to reach out. So now we're talking about adding an additional number of people to the service mix. I will tell you at the end, the gratitude by staff for them saying this was so good because the people we helped were so grateful. And that, I think, made the difference for us in, in one way to create this culture. The other thing we do is, it's the, kind of a, an age-old principle, is that we're not just giving out fish, we're teaching people how to fish. So there's a long-term supportive problem. I heard uh, Renee mention recovery is a long-term deal. Recovery in my world is the rest of your life. And so teaching people and giving them the tools that they need so that they don't relapse, but if they do, how to come back. Uh, if they know how to cope with stress or stri uh, strife. It's interesting to me, while I was sitting in the back of the room and you were talking, I said, have we had any response from people from Imelda that were here before? And the answer was not so far. And that was surprising because I would have thought, judging from the trauma that our own staff were experiencing last week, that that would have been something that would have been rather have popped up. So it's on a continuum. Uh, we intervene early, we provide tools and support, we give them a way to come back. You're never not ever, you're never closed out as a client at the council. Uh, and we're connected to a number of other agencies, uh, more than 50 with whom we collaborate. So there's always that come back and see us, call us if you need us, and then what we call in the world recovery support. Are you taking your medications? Are you managing your lifestyle? Are you doing the things that you need to do to minimize some of this in your life? And then along comes a flood, and then we see trauma. And that I think is one of the messages I want to talk a lot about, is that trauma never goes away. Trauma, you know, they used to say, put it behind you, it's over, mm -mm, not true. And I think I want donors to understand that trauma is an ongoing thing once it occurs. It's in the brain, it's there forever, as we all know. And so how we deal with that in the future and helping people not just deal with don't drink or uh, manage your mental health and your depression or some of the other things that are going on, but how we deal with these problems when trauma is always a part of it for the next flood or for the next storm or for the next traumatic event that's going to happen, that is going to happen in our town. So, so let's talk about that for a little while because I think that one of the things that donors are challenged by, I think what you all as the service providers are challenged by, is, is this tension between trying to lay track in the system and, and train others to do the work so that it can live beyond just your grant funding or your own particular staff, and yet people are in chaos. People's needs are immediate and have to be addressed then. So, so how do you balance that tension and, and, and what systems were you able to put in place so that it can live longer to address the next crisis? You want to go? Go ahead. <laughs> I'll defer to you. Okay. Um, well, no, we, we were so fortunate to be partnering with Mental Health America because in the immediate aftermath, what we recognized is that many of the school-based clinicians that were hardest hit by the hurricane were not gonna be in a place to be able to provide the types of services that the kids would need. And so one of the things that we did with Mental Health America is that we were able to reach out to our entire community and say, if you are a community provider and you would like to provide services in some of our hardest hit schools, please attend this training. We will pay you to go out to the school we will deploy you to some of the schools that were hardest hit, and then you can provide these services to them. And that actually worked really well. I mean, we had a, a great turnout, um, and we were able to deploy people who themselves have the, the mental health capacity 
to be able to provide those services because one of the lessons learned that I'm sure we'll talk about is that um, you know the teachers and school-based clinicians that were hardest hit by Harvey really needed to take care of themselves first and they were not going to be in a position to provide those services so in the immediate aftermath it was really about deploying those people who could help um, and then over the longer term recognizing that we need we needed a tiered model so we really needed to understand which are the kids who are a little bit stressed but just need some basic coping skills and then who are the kids who are really having symptoms of PTSD who actually need a higher level intervention um, and that's something that we've been really working toward is helping the consumers understand you know because I think a lot of the schools were a little bit confused about <clears throat> well there's this great program you know from Save the Children and there's a great program from Trauma and Grief Center and what which which do we need and how, and so I think coming up with a plan for you know at this level here is the program that we would recommend at this level here's the program we would recommend and really helping the schools and the, and the clinicians understand what's needed mm -hmm. I think I would just add to that one of the things that um, Again, an opportunity like this provides us to think outside of the box, and we had a really great um, collaboration with a company called Cognito, as well as uh, UNICEF, right? Everybody's familiar with UNICEF, and generally UNICEF works internationally, but with the magnitude of this disaster, we were able to work with them, and through that, so again, this is the capacity building within these schools to help um, teachers, uh, Cognito is a simulation company, so what they did was create simulations that helped teachers learn how to address uh, problems related to trauma, like how do you ask that question? So it was all about role playing and we've had uh, tremendous uh, feedback from the schools that have used this. Um, and one of the things that while we're talking about Houston that, that you know, the dollars that you have provided to support this kind of work, we're able to take these lessons out into the community. And Houston is really being seen as a leader in working with trauma-affected areas. And you all should be very proud of that, having contributed to that. Um, and when we go out, we learn other things um, that we are able to bring back to Houston and, and identify some of so, so now you talked about building on the lessons that you learned um, in Katrina, and so I would ask, what what's different now? What what is it that we are learning? What is it that you have learned about these services, and what sort of exists that's different pre Harvey and post Harvey? Yeah, um, I think. One of the things that's interesting, and, and it, it, it occurred in this room before we officially started, and that is I have relationships with people who work for the county, who work for churches, who work for other places, because we were in the experience together. So there's, uh, as, as Renee said with Imelda, uh, we've already vetted the providers. We know who's getting the job done. We know uh, what to do. I don't need to explain to Jim Nutter what the council will do when we show up. He knows. And having that infrastructure in place for the next time uh, has been really the, the most important. To contrast with Katrina, when we were saying we need space for 12-step meetings and the county people were saying, what's a 12-step meeting? There's no real need to do that anymore. The infrastructure is there. We respond together. Uh, that's true for the Harris Center and Harris Health, who are real big public providers as well. We know what to do. The response system is in place. Um, what, however, I would say that the thing that, that we would want to look at now and, and Imelda was a good example. Um, we had to close early. We had many clients who couldn't come in. There was both a loss of service and a loss of revenue and a loss of support due to that. And I haven't yet measured that impact. It's something we do, it's something we'll continue to do, but we're beginning to factor in almost like flood days or snow days. We're beginning to factor into our service planning flood days or closed days 
Um, and it's a problem in terms of how nonprofits, particularly those that are not f publicly funded, how we manage cash flow, how we manage on a sliding scale, how we manage to help people, because we don't turn anybody away and we'll never do that. So that's kind of what I would say is if we've got the infrastructure, now how do we begin to tweak some of the pieces and refine it, which would be the next stage moving forward. Mm -hmm. who, who should be a part of that conversation? Well, the people in this room, and I think the, the funders and donors clearly, who have a stake in this and want a part of it. But I will also say the county officials need to, to continue to be with us at the table. Um, the disaster planning people, uh, the school people, school officials who I think learned a lot from the experience that we were also in a number of schools. I think that we should all continue to have these dialogues very much like Harris County Disaster Planning is doing. They meet regularly to talk about it. And I would love to see us do that in the behavioral health world as well. So I, I would ask, I know we're getting kind of short on time and want to open it up for general questions. But I, so I have one last question for all of you as the, the panelists. What is it that you know now that you wish you had known before? <laughs> I think, um, you know, every disaster is different. So it's, uh, it's a really hard question to answer. Um, or or what, what, have you, it, yeah. Yeah, what, what have you learned that you want to see continue? Um, I think one of the, the things that we learned uh, actually that really impacts the, the people in this room, that you were here for us. Um, and also, um, and I think Renee mentioned it earlier, was that um, you all understand that this work is, um, it, there are peaks and valleys within this work. You know, we didn't see mental health um, issues really come uh, full circle till about 18 months after the uh, uh, yeah, after after the hurricane. It wasn't immediate. Everybody was focused on those immediate needs. But for funders to understand that, uh, in fact, I we had a funder who just came to us last year who didn't jump right in and said, "We heard you were doing great work. What what happens now?" Um, and when we talk about that, we talked about that in terms of resiliency, right? Because we have to think about prevention and how we build that within this community. And the best way to do that is through that resiliency piece. So they funded us for the next two years to provide some additional workshops and trainings that we'll be able to do to build that capacity. So I think we, we learned a, a number of lessons. I think something that we weren't fully aware of um, was just the extent of the traumas experienced by our immigrant youth. And we have learned that through Harvey because we, again, were, we were able to deploy some of our trauma and grief clinicians onto our mobile unit that serves that population. And I, you know, I've been in this, doing this work for a while, and I will tell you that the stories that we hear from those children are beyond anything I've ever heard before in terms of the atrocities that they've experienced in their home country and then even along their journey. And then to come here and be uh, impacted by Harvey was just you know, the straw that broke the camel's back for most of them. So I would say um, you know, this is a population that we are very dedicated to. And because we recognize the mental health need through the Greater Houston Community Foundation and the other funders that we've worked with, we've been able to leverage that to provide a dedicated therapy mobile unit for that, that group. So we're now going out to those areas just solely focused on addressing the mental health needs. Um, so that was a very important lesson. I think the other piece of this that we've learned sort of the hard way is that you know, when, when we have an active service within our trauma and grief center, we have our clinicians seeing kids all day, every day, you know, working with those children. So it's very hard to just deploy them. 
and it's also hard to hire the right people. You know, we really pride ourselves on finding really talented, usually bilingual clinicians who are trauma-informed who can really do this work. So that was something that slowed us down a little bit, um, you know, after Harvey was finding the right people. One of the things that we're really hoping to do is develop a disaster response team where at the drop of a hat we can start to deploy people and we've really had to do this for a number of different issues that tragically have occurred in our, in our community, um, including the Santa Fe school shooting, Odessa, El Paso, um, you know, and, and sort of the list goes on. We really recognize the need to have people who we could readily deploy in the event of another disaster, whether it's a natural or man-made disaster. Um, and you know, finally, I will just say that I think, thanks to the Greater Houston Community Foundation and what we've been able to do, I'm hopeful that we are going to be able to help other communities. We now have funding to go out to Puerto Rico and try to replicate some of the work that we've done here. So there have been a lot of lessons learned, and we're grateful for that. So, I know now is that the need is much bigger than we thought it was for the kind of work that we did um, and that the, the people in need will respond if the help is offered um, and I wish now looking back that we had asked for uh, twice as much money uh, because at the end we could have spent it uh, without without struggle uh, it would have helped more people uh, no doubt. We're continuing to help those people, but through other resources and, and more sometimes at, at their expense or at a different level. The other thing that I know now is that the state and federal money is much slower to respond than the local community. And uh, how we make that happen, I think, is very critical uh, to the overall funding and support of an infrastructure because they've got bigger dollars. There won't be another J.J. Watt. But where this all happens and how it happens, I think, is, is room for us to talk more. I wish now I had known that was going to be a slow to non-existent response in, in my world. Yeah. So, so that's probably a, a good place to, uh, you can put on, to um, open up the dialogue to, to the larger group. Um, so, I mean, certainly we could be in this session. I would love to talk to you for the rest of the day. Um, but on a short period of time, I, I think that you've given us an excellent overview um, of what you were challenged by and what's in place and what we are still remaining to be challenged by. So I would just open it up to the um, audience for questions and that you may have. Yes, yes. Um. I was very lucky to be invited to a deep kids for PPH a while back and you know we did with Dr. Kaplow and I was very impressed with the, the work they're doing. Um, for me, I'm from Rosario County. I live in Rosario County. I do a lot of work in Rosario County. Rosario County was hit very hard. I was at an event about a week and a half ago where someone said, and I don't know if this is true, but that uh, Brazoria County has one of the highest suicide rates in the country. Um, and I know one of the things I mentioned at our luncheon was that I was concerned that even as a parent who did a TCH, uh, had children at TCH for 17 years, I had no idea that this fabulous department existed. And um, even since then, I've become more concerned that the pediatric center around town is more of a, a barrier to accessing those services and maybe, um, you know, finding those kids that need help. Um, the question is, is there a plan to, like, you know, through the network, to the urgent care centers, to the pediatric center, really make them aware of what you do and how okay. they're happening. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. I'm, I'm really glad. I'm really glad you asked that because that was actually something that, again, came out of Harvey was no one knew we existed. And part of that is that we had moved the Trauma and Grief Center over to Texas Children's Hospital literally two weeks before Harvey hit. Um, and so we were up and running rapidly right after that. But our plan is actually to start educating the entire hospital 
Um, so we have a plan to help the hospital become more trauma-informed by helping them understand the services that are being offered within the Trauma and Grief Center. In addition, we have a plan to roll that out across all of our Texas Children's Pediatric Outpatient Clinics. So that'll be all 50 of them. Um, to again help them understand not just how to recognize trauma in kids, but how to make an appropriate referral to us and how to get them in rapidly. And also, you know, as you know, um, many of our families in the community are not aware that we provide free services. So really helping people understand that we don't, we don't bill, um, you know, we, we make it safe for our immigrant families to come to us. So that's absolutely something we're hoping to roll out. And to be honest with you, I think initially, we were scared to tell everybody <laughs> mm -hmm. um, because we, we were afraid of, of having this yes. influx and not having the capacity. Now I feel like we're fairly well, um, we're, we're capable of seeing many more kids. So that's absolutely something we're gonna do. We probably have time for one or two more questions before the next session. Yes. Yeah. Hey, um, thank you for your remarks. I think it was also encouraging to see um, the uptake of services over the long term because I know that was an area that we kind of struggled immediately after the disaster response to put dollars out there but to actually see the utilization so um anyway I, I appreciate your remarks too on asking for for more so congrats to all of you all on exceeding your goals um, my question is really around um were there any unanticipated kind of big wins in terms of referrals coming to you all in ways that you didn't anticipate i know one of our other observations in doing kind of the direct home repair was seeing a lot of families under stress, but knowing that folks who are out there to do repairs were not necessarily equipped to provide the emotional and behavioral support that family might need. So just curious what the learnings and observations are in that space, in terms of like co-embedding services. I can respond real quick. The biggest win for us was being able to identify people who might not otherwise have known about us, given that we were going out into the community with outreach. Uh, and we were literally handing out flyers and, and, and in high, high impacted areas. So I think if the infrastructure is in place, those people hopefully now know how to find us again rather than feeling lost. Um, that seems to be, despite what I said about Imelda not calling, I think we continue to maintain a fairly impactful level in high risk areas. Judy was sharing with me earlier um, about 28% of the people we helped were homeless before Harvey. And so I hope we've put in place uh, more opportunities for people to know about the infrastructures that exist and how to access. I think the second part of that is the county and city officials now know that there's this private infrastructure in place that they can avail themselves of rather than doing it alone or trying to set it up in other ways. Maybe one last question, quick question. Were there tools that you were using with the children that you found were beneficial to the parents? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so Beneficial to what? To parents. To parents. Okay. Yeah. So I think that um, the answer is yes, but I think that a lot of that came from us being able to help parents understand what the tools were saying. You know, so for example, the screening tool that we developed to assess different hurricane-related exposure risk factors. We then, when we saw that a child you know, had been trapped in the home, had lost their dog, had A, B, and C happen, we were then able to say to the parent, you know, these three things seem to be predictors of post-traumatic stress over the longer term. That's why we wanna keep a close eye on your child. You know, so helping them understand that. And then similarly, our brief um, post-traumatic stress assessment tool was very helpful to parents to be able to see, okay, Actually, you know, we had a lot of concerned parents who we evaluated their child and the child seemed to be doing fine. Um, and so reassuring them and, and that became a really important tool for the parent too. Thank you.